good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the Human Service uh, Conference Committee. So uh, we have a quorum. We'll get started. And members, and also to the public, today is the uh, the community day, and we have some distinguished uh, guests here with us. Uh, we will we'll start with. Uh, the commissioner, and then I'll give instruction to the to the other individuals who are going to be testifying. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Noor and members of the committee. Between the money not appropriated last year and the budget surplus this year, we're talking in the final negotiations this year about trading off great stuff versus great stuff. The people of Minnesota will benefit from this surplus budget however final decisions are made. We're currently comparing bills focusing on supporting the caring professions from nursing facilities to group homes for people with disabilities to elderly waiver services to home care. All parties have the same intention as shoring up these sectors to support stronger providers and livable wages. We're working with historic investments in this space of $1.3 billion in the first biennium and $1.5 billion in the second. There are lists of bills that provide different amounts for different sectors to sort out, all with the same intention, but currently different distributions. DHS leadership has held a series of conversations with hospitals, nursing homes, group homes, our own direct care and treatment services and counties about solutions to the hospital decompression issue for high acuity patients. We'd like to see this formalized with an ongoing commission, series of summits, and or the study that's been proposed. We're pleased that a number of bills support people with disabilities to thrive while living more independently in community. Eliminating TEFRA fees, helping families support their children with disabilities. Removing the asset limit for employed people with disabilities. Increasing wages for people with disabilities. The most recent opioid overdose deaths in Minnesota topped 1,300 people last year. The vast majority coming from fentanyl and other opioids. And it is Native and Black Minnesotans experiencing the harshest disparities, with Native Minnesotans dying at nine times the rate of others, and Black Minnesotans over three times. It's clearly time to take strong, decisive action. And the governor's revised budget contains many new and ongoing investments, totaling $225 million over four years. The governor's revised budget also includes many investments intended to address the disparities and outcomes in different communities, such as traditional healing grants, technical assistance for culturally specific organizations, expanding Project ECHO Practitioner Hub, startup and capacity building grants for withdrawal management. We're also hearing about good results from initiatives underway in other states and believe that we need to try some new approaches as the approaches we've been using have not sufficiently reduced the impact of substance use disorder in our communities. The governor's revised budget includes a public awareness campaign of access to treatment services, on-site naloxone for schools, housing programs in jails, safe recovery sites, harm reduction, and culturally specific grants. Let's try these approaches that have good reports from other states and see what works here in Minnesota. In terms of our direct care and treatment services, we firmly believe the time has come to separate DHS's statewide behavioral health system from our policy administrations in St. Paul. As such, the governor's revised budget includes these needs for direct care and treatment. It's full operating adjustment to help DCT prepare to become a separate agency. It's budget deficiency, the result of incentives and bonuses to retain staff for our behaviorally challenged patients. It's electronic medical record, the last health system in the state that would get in compliance with the 2015 Minnesota mandate. An adjustment to the 48-hour rule, as it is simply not possible in today's workforce shortage to fully comply with the current rule. As we've been in dialogue with hospital systems and other providers taking high acuity patients, we've decided that we can't ask others to do their share unless we do too. I'm pleased to report that DCT's made a few internal administrative changes to free up space in our facilities and has admitted 128 new patients in the month of April, including 45 from jails and 38 from community hospitals, getting our priority admissions wait list down below 50 this week. We are ready to work with the House and Senate to support the crafting of a final bill for these vital sectors for the people of Minnesota, trading off great stuff versus great stuff. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commission. I think uh, there are amazing things in this bill uh, that we look forward to making sure that uh, we're successful through this conference. So uh, if you may stick around just in, ta in case there's any question. Members, do you have any quick question for the Commissioner? Uh, Senator Abloh. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would have many questions, but I, I, I'm going to try to hold my questions. But um, So I presume I'm here to listen. But I just wanted to offer just kind of a minor objection um, to the, the agenda. You know, Roman numerals, if there's a body that would use Roman numerals, Mr. Pre Mr. Chair, it should be the Senate. So, thank you. <laughs> Peter, Peter. Uh, th thank you, Senator. I agree with you. <laughs> we have more than 50 testifiers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Uh, just a real quick question on the clarification on the new admissions at, to DTC. Did that also include any kids or were those all adults? Commissioner. I don't have the data with me, but I'll let you know. Mostly adults, of course, but I'll let you know. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, Chair, if you could, uh, I just do have uh, and just a follow-up. So, um, and not for an hour to put you on the spot, but I think um, we have more time, Senator. I think uh, to ask the commissioner. Go ahead. Oh no, I, do, I don't think she's prepared to answer the question. But it would help me to know, like, um, if there's five things out of the budget that you really want. You know, there's many demands, and many people here would agree you have some fine ideas, but they have a fine idea. So it would help me to know privately or otherwise, what your chief priorities are. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Abel. Uh, Mr. Commissioner. Chair and Senator Abel, I'd be delighted to share that list with you. <laughs> um, if it's going to take a long time, maybe we will <laughs> take after the recess. We, we can wait for that, Commissioner. Yes. Th th no, thank you so I much meant. for your testimony. <laughs> yeah. uh, the next person on the list today is uh, our Attorney General, Keith Ellison. Tony General, welcome to the committee. Please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, uh, Representative Noor uh, and Representative uh, Senator Hoffman and all members. Keith Ellis, sorry about that. Keith Ellison here, your Attorney General, and I'm here to really just speak about one provision uh, that uh, is uh, in the DHS proposal, but it affects the Attorney General's office significantly, and I just think that is important. I want to impress upon you the importance of action on this particular matter. Uh, under, under the current law, um, uh, it is required that the Department of Human Services transfer inmate to a state-run facility within 48 hours of a civil commitment. Now, if you think about this law for a moment, you'll, you'll, you will immediately recognize that this law, compliance with it, requires enough people to meet the needs and enough beds to meet the needs. You gotta have both of those things and maybe more to fulfill the requirements of this law. We don't have either one. And as a result, we're not meeting the requirements of the 48 hour law and people are suing. I don't believe we can meet the resource needs in an instant, but we can change the law to give DHFs enough flexibility so that we can meet the requirements of the law and I think I would advise that we think about how to, you know, expedite the process. That is going to require people in beds and is going to take a little longer, but at least in the short term, I believe it's possible to change the law to give DHS more flexibility so that it can meet the requirements of the law and thereby uh, make it such that we're not the target of the vast amount of litigation that we're facing at this very moment. So the, the Minnesota Attorney General's Office is in active litigation regarding the issues surrounding the priority admission statute, 48-hour rule. The office defers, I defer, to uh, Commissioner Harpstead regarding whether and how exactly to amend the statute, but I do support the amendment of the statute. Uh, we'll, we'll, we defer to them on the, on the language, but we think that it needs to happen. Uh, what I'm here to do is to share how the litigation consequences uh, to the state uh, uh, affect, us, affect us in general. Since 2017, the Attorney General has represented the Department of Human Services in at least 16 matters regarding the priority admission statute. 16. These matters range from attempts to hold the commissioner in contempt. And, it, and as I, when I, I worry whenever one of my clients has to worry about bringing a, a toothbrush to court because she doesn't know what's going to happen next, if you know what I mean. 
Uh, motions range, uh, in the, and they include things like uh, to force, force the admission of, of an individual, uh, civil rights lawsuits, petitions for writ of mandamus, which is a legal mechanism to make the commissioner do a thing, whether or not she has the tools, the, the people or the beds to get it done, and take all, signif and take all significant time uh, and, and by our, our office. Our office has to represent the department on all these matters. And I'll just point out to you with something you already know, the Attorney General's Office, by statute, Minnesota Statute 8.06, represents every state agency, every board, every commission, both houses of our legislature, and every constitutional officer. So this is in addition to a whole bunch of other things we need to do. Currently, we are actively, actively defending the Department of Human Services in at least two class action lawsuits. And my staff is telling me there's at least three more so we could end up, we, I think we have about five either active or pending. Uh, where the plaintiffs the, the, are suing the DHS because they're not admitted within 48 hours of their commitment order. We're also defending the Department of Human uh, DHS, and here's the other three, uh, in three petitions for a writ of mandamus related to the commissioner's compliance with the priority admission statute, which she would love to comply with but she has needs resources and beds and other things to do it. Other, otherwise, it's impossible. Let me tell you a little bit about these cases. In two of those cases, the district court held the commissioner held that the commissioner failed to comply with their duties under the law because the plaintiffs were not admitted to a DHS facility within 48 hours of their commitment, even though there were no medically appropriate beds available to any DHS hospital or treatment facility for those individuals. And when you look at, the, look at it from the judge's perspective, the judge is like, look, it's the legislature's job to write the law. It's my job to interpret it. This is what the law says. This is what I must do. And so I'm not even faulting the court. I'm not even here to say it was a bad decision. I'm simply saying it was an impossible decision. It was, it was impossible to comply from the perspective of my client, DHS. The other one, the Department of Human Rights disagrees with the decisions. We do disagree with it. We oppose those decisions. But a lot of that opposition boils down to, like, you know, impossibility. Uh, and we continue to litigate those cases. Clarification in the priority admission statute should impact future lawsuits by giving the courts the civilly and civilly committed individuals and the department guidance regarding how patients should be prioritized when they are committed following a finding of incompetency and uh, there is not a medically appropriate bed immediately available. So as you deliberate, I, uh, I do ask you humbly to really reflect upon how we can uh, provide enough flexibility to uh, allow DHS to do what it needs to do and stay in compliance with the law. And in the longer term, think about how we address some of these resource needs. So that's uh, what I'd like to share with the committee today, Senator and Representative and all members, and I thank you for your kind attention to this matter. Uh, thank you, Attorney General. I think some members have quick questions. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, uh, uh, General. I, I appreciate you, and I appreciate the clarification. They almost put me in that uh, that lower chamber, and I, I <laughs> from from where you served, and and it's interesting because you know, ten years ago is when you know a, a former colleague of yours uh, was a, a state uh, rep who came with the the problems that we had regarding forty eight hour, and and the legislature moved, and and thank you for putting out your pressure points. That's one of the follow ups I was going to ask is where are these pressure points within the system, right? And so I look forward to the technical assistance from the Department of Human Services, and I would hope that also you have your county attorney's folks that are also, I know, engaged with you, and, and, I, and I would assume they're also engaged with the commissioner because they also understand those pressure points as well. And, and for you to highlight that, you know, when a judge is there to interpret what the law says and it's kind of an impossibility um, we need to we need to fix that, and I, I look forward to hopefully the if you have some ideas that you've shared with the department, if you could share with with those of us on the panel, that would be that would be great as well. And I appreciate your time here, and, and thanks for all your service. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator. Well, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would uh, actually 
appreciate a longer discussion about this at some point, it, if we're going to try to resolve this. I was there when we passed the law. I don't remember if you were there, uh, Mr. Ellison, but um, you know, I was just like, what's a writ of mandamus? I looked it up. So it's supposed to be rare. That means where the uh, superior court tells an inferior person uh, that they need to do their job pretty right. much. And I, nobody can argue with that. Um, but I, I, I may be mistaken, but there's nothing in this proposal from the governor's office to add more staff or add more places, just a request to put the law off and not do anything about it. And I, I don't see that as useful either. And I understand your position. I, and I, I don't think that Commissioner Harp said should go to court with a toothbrush. This contempt thing is not a good remedy. Uh, the remedy is to find a remedy. And there's a record amount of money in these two budgets to, uh, of, that's ever going to come again. I'm nervous that we can even support the money we're spending. But there, I think we need to get a proposal, Mr. Chair, to find some way to uh, fix this rather than put it off. So that I, I, I'm going to stop there. But I, I really appreciate the dialogue, and I'm glad I learned a new word. And, but I, I don't want my commissioner in jail for the weekend. And, Me neither. <laughs> with the other people there who don't want to be there either. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, let me, let me say, Senator Abler, I completely agree with you. Uh, it, it's basically a resource issue. We could do it if we had enough beds and people. I don't know if that's possible to do in the short term because it takes, <laughs> even if you've got the money, you still got to design it right. And so I am 100% in favor of uh, figuring that out. And I think you're right. Maybe it, sh it should not be deferred. Maybe there's a study that could be done on what the best way to go is, get some good recommendations. Mr. Chair. But in a short period of time, some flexibility in the rule might be in order. Senator Abel. Well, just in brief, the only way to get resources is for somebody to ask for the resources. And in the bill we have here, I don't see a request for stuff. And I, we need staff. How are you going to find staff? You know, we're buying other 400 people in a paid family leave department and uh, 200 people in a pot department. If there's something more important, it'd be this to find 100 people to work to get rid of 50. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator. I think the 48-hour rule needs to be reformed. And thanks for the suggestion for the study. And also, we, we've got a good provision in the House uh, bill, so we look forward to having the conversation with our counterpart in the Senate. So thank you so much, Attorney General, and also to the Commissioner. And now we'll move to the members of the public. Uh, we have 50 individuals, and then two minutes, please. Uh, we will have a sign up here to show you that the 30 seconds left. Uh, if we go beyond 11, we will recess and then come back if necessary, but we're hoping that we can be done by 11. Uh, the first person that we have is uh, Ambassador Kaplan. If you can come to the table, followed by Commissioner uh, Clark, uh, if you can get uh, ready and get close by. So. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. My name is Sam Kaplan. I've practiced law for a long time, but I've also been in the nursing home business for 35 years. An interesting business, to be sure, and this is the first time I've appeared before your committee. The nursing homes that we own are, for the most part, in Minnesota. Many of them are in small towns. They're the center of community life, frequently the largest employer in town. And over the years, they have worked well. There's a reimbursement formula that is less than perfect, but somehow we survived. Although as time has gone on, our partners have been more our bankers than anyone else. And there's a reimbursement formula that you're going to hear about today from skilled people who know more than I do from leading age and other organizations. And there are worthwhile things to be heard from all of them. But I want to say this. The reimbursement formula that is in place isn't working anymore. On January 1st, a reimbursement number was put in the place 
based upon the performance of the facilities 27 months ago. And 27 months ago, uh, things have changed. We need to have a serious modification of the rules. This is basically a collaboration. It's a collaboration between the nursing home owners, the people who are at the state and federal governments, and the extended families of the individuals. There obviously needs to be a, an injection of funding, and there needs to be an injection of a new system that will take account of the fact that we had a pandemic and we had inflation and the system isn't working. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Terrell Clark, a Stearns County Commissioner. I'm here today on behalf of AMC, Maxa, and Micah. You've done great work. There's many things that we sent a letter about, so I will not be addressing them. Ironically, you probably just had a little bit of a, um, a reprieve on the 48-hour rule with Ambassador Kaplan, but I would like to speak to you particularly about two items um, in these, uh, these bills. Um, one is the Senate language to eliminate at least part of the county cost share as it relates to mentally ill and dangerous individuals and the House proposed language to address the 48-hour rule. Um, first off, I um, want to thank the Senate for finding some room in the tails. And uh, Mr. Chair, I hope that uh, in the conference committee you all will be able to find some. Uh, right now, it's 100% um, count on the counties. And we don't have any determination ability to decide where a person's getting moved when it's happening among others. And so even the 50% would be helpful, although we'd like to work with you on getting to the state picking that up, which goes to actually the proposed 48 hour rule changes. And I wanna thank you for the idea of a work group. I served on the competency restoration task force. We'd like to be part of this work. Unfortunately, right now, there hasn't been any hearings on this issue and changing, amending it would be a really big deal. I appreciate what my friend, the Attorney General, just said about lawsuits, but there is nothing here that says how this is gonna be better for anybody, what the plan is, what's gonna help make them safe. Um, an example in Stearns County, there are many across the state in each of your counties. We had somebody fairly recently in the last year who was psychotic. He should have been there. He should have been transferred there. Instead, he languished for two months in our jail. Our jail staff is under We've, we've got worker force issues too. They didn't have the capacity, they don't have the skills, they don't have the expertise. Two months later, not surprisingly, he gets moved and he's creating, he created hordes of problems. We have adults and when teenagers that are sitting in our hospital that need to be going. So the 48 hour at least rule for now should stay in place until we can figure out some solutions because otherwise, you're gonna be having people languishing in places where they shouldn't be instead of getting the care they need. So looking forward to working with you on this, um, but at least until something really has been looked at and that we have the resources that can come back to you, um, we strongly uh, recommend that you keep the current rule. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, we look forward to having more conversation on that. Uh, Sarah you, Kastner, Mr. please welcome to the committee, followed by Karen Herman, and then also Dr. Prasad, please get close by. Thank you, Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, and members of the Human Services Conference Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Kasner. I'm a family of six, including my husband, Dan, and four boys, AJ, Ben, Caleb, and Dunkey. I'm here to to speak in support of the legislation that increased the paid hours of personal assistance services provided by parents and spouses, a provision that is included in the Senate Human Services Omnibus Bill, as well as the governor's budget recommendations. Currently, there's a 40-hour household cap for the numbers of hours a parent can be reimbursed for CDCS and CFSS disability services to a child, which means no more than 40 hours can be paid to one or both parents regardless of the number of parents available, the number of children receiving services, and the severity of their needs. We have not one but two boys that suffer from a rare genetic progressive and terminal disease called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 
Every movement that Caleb, who's nine, and Dunkey, eight, make, makes them weaker as the muscles replaced with fatty tissue. This eventually will end with the lungs and the heart. Life expectancy, late, 20, late teens or early 20s. Our kids can't do what typical kids their age can. They need help with all simple daily tasks that most take for granted. But we as their parents help them because it means more time with them, as we don't know how much time we will get. So it means I would rather help my kids with toileting if I just get one more minute with them. We help them because I am also not guaranteed tomorrow. As a carrier of Duchenne, I am now followed carefully by a cardiologist as I'm at heightened risk for fibrosis of the heart. As if that wasn't enough, it could mean I could also may not be here to help them. My kids stay home. My husband stays home to be the main care provider, and I work full-time in a demanding job while, of course, helping with the boys. But I'm always exhausted. I wake up well before the sun, take turns helping with various requests throughout the night. We get the kids ready for school, and then I work all day and manage my schedule to take them to doctor's appointments. And then at night, I work. I work until I'm too tired to make up for time that I chose to spend with my kids. But what if it were different? What if the legislature acted this session to raise the weekly cap on hours for parents and spouses providing care, and I could dial back at my regular job so I could provide personal assistance services to my children under CDCS? Ms. Kessner, if you can wrap up, please. I urge you to please accept the Senate position and include Article 1, Sections 21 and 46 in your final human services omnibus bill. Thank you. Uh, the next person is going to join us via Zoom. Karen Hammond, please. Uh, Welcome to the committee and introduce yourself and proceed. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, representatives, senators, and other distinguished guests and colleagues. Thank you for your support of Minnesotans with disabilities. Your work is important to their success in community living and employment. I'm Karen Herman, Executive Director at UDAC. UDAC is a nonprofit located in Duluth that provides services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health challenges to help them be successful in finding employment and meaningfully involved in their communities. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the governor's proposal to phase out special subminimum wages for people with disabilities in the House. As a provider of disability services for over 54 years that recently ended a 14C subminimum wage program, I can attest to the benefits that have been experienced by the people we are privileged to serve. Ending an in-center employment program and the use of some minimum wage has changed many people's lives for the better. Individuals previously in my sub-minimum wage program have found a sense of community belonging and experienced economic advancement through new jobs with new employers and in roles in the community that were not thought possible before this time. Each person is now more fully involved and part of the community. They use public transportation, have established new friendships, have received a first ever performance appraisal with a raise, and many have achieved independence in their work. These are individuals that it was thought not possible to achieve at this level. Most importantly, they have gained self-confidence and the self-esteem to take on new challenges and new opportunities to be more fully engaged in their communities. They're no longer observers of the community, they are actual participants in the community. These successes were possible through the creation of programs that allow people to explore their communities and have experiences that open doors for them in the community through involvement and participation. Individuals who have been in in-center programs under constant supervision and direction for 20 years or more are being successful in community employment. These new programs support growth and change. The 14C program limited their opportunities and kept them from community experiences that supported participation and opportunity. Employers that we were concerned would not hire at minimum wage, minimum wage said yes when we Ms. asked. Ms. Hammond, if you can they wrap did, uh, your testimony, please. I'm sorry? If you can wrap up uh, your testimony. Sure. They did not hesitate to work with our program. The people, my experience is that outdated program designed for another time, restricted opportunity and limited options. When we changed what we did and how we approached employment and inclusive involvement, the success that people of all abilities achieved was exceptional. Thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to um, speak in behalf of supporting subminimum wage elimination. Uh, thank you. Dr. Prasad, please uh, proceed with your testimony. Introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Dr. Aarti Prasad. I'm an internist, a primary care and integrative medicine physician, executive overseeing Project ECHO. 
at Hennepin Healthcare. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Chair Noor and Chair Hoffman for funding for Hennepin Healthcare to continue current project echoes and, and to add additional programs to serve our diverse communities. We urge you to accept the Senate language that ensures Project ECHO funding is ongoing, as one-time funding would result in a program ending right when it gets started. I would like to also thank Representative Noor. Um, has, he has been very instrumental in and supporter since Project ECHO was originally funded in Minnesota in 2019. We heard earlier at the beginning of the session the number of opioid-related deaths, the need for new treatment modalities, the use of cultural healing practices, and Project ECHO is going to address all of that. There is a shortage of trained addiction medicine physicians and addiction psychologists in rural Minnesota, and Project ECHO is a model that is there to treat complex diseases in rural and underserved communities by moving knowledge, not people, via regular teleconferencing and with experts for didactic and case-based learning. We also support the proposal uh, for Project ECHO from the governor to uh, establish ECHOs for outpatient treatment programs. In summary, we urge you to accept the Senate language that includes ongoing funding for this elegant cooperative model, which is a true partnership between the communities and academic teaching hospital um, and rural physicians. And for Medicaid population in rural Minnesota, Project ECHO is a solution for best practices and care where there are no specialists. It is cost effective. Uh, providers have better um, access to, patients have better access to care. Uh, provider uh, are sharing knowledge. It improves quality of care close to patients' home. Healthcare dollars will be spent in local communities when pa where patients are able to receive care uh, from their local provider instead of traveling to the Twin Cities. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We would appreciate your support for ongoing funding so we can continue to provide and expand Project ECHO. And we also support the proposal uh, for Project ECHO from the governor to establish thank ECHOs for outpatient treatment programs. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. And uh, I believe, uh, Ms. Stott, you're sitting at the table. Uh, oh, I There's have one Commissioner. more ahead of me. Uh, Commissioner Jeff Lundy is ahead of me. Oh, oh. yes. So I've got Commissioner sitting behind you. Oh. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, and members. Uh, my name is Jeff Lundy. I represent District 1, Hennepin County, uh, County Board. I want to thank you for taking the time to hear my testimony today and for your commitment to investing in our most vulnerable Minnesotans and the systems and the people who care for them. Hennepin County is grateful for your unprecedented work to ensure the voices of the people most impacted by this legislation has been heard and centered as you created this funding package. There's much to be excited about this bill and we are grateful to Chair Hoffman and the Senate for including funding for counties to match dollars we put in for our residents who are high acuity, yet await access to appropriate treatment settings as well as naming counties as eligible vendors for medical assistant peer services. Peer support workers are people with lived experience in mental health or substance use disorder recovery process and allowing counties to bill for these services will help us expand our support for residents. We're also excited to see investments to reduce racial disparities in healthcare outcomes through funding for building our long-term care workforce in our new American communities and through Project ECHO. In the House bill, we're excited to see child protection grants to help families impacted by opioid use disorder, additional support for licensing, and support for comprehensively examine our state's high acuity treatment network and capacity. But more than any individual provision, the greatest impact this bill will have is on elderly Minnesotans and those living with a disability and the talented, skilled, and absolutely critical people who care for them. These needed investments to rate increases are long overdue as the support for families access, accessing care through TEFRA. The modifications to asset limits will allow people with disabilities to maintain greater economic security, something many of us take for granted. So I just want to say thank you again, Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, and members of your, for this work on this critical committee and for this bill that will make an enormous difference to the lives of those in Hennepin County and across the state. We look forward to continue working with you to enact the strongest possible legislation to support opportunity for all Minnesotans to live their best lives. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. And then uh, after Ms. Dart, we'll have uh, Rob Woodlock online. So please proceed, introduce yourself. Chair Hoffman, Chair Noor, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Alyssa Dott, and I'm the Senior Director of Host Homes, Care Coordination, and Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services at Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. On behalf of LSS, thank you to the House and Senate for your commitment to making long-term investments in human services that will improve access to service, build community connection, and remove barriers to health and well-being for our neighbors. LSS has provided written testimony, noting several provis provisions we support, and I would like to uplift one, the development of life sharing and consultation with providers, people with disabilities, advocacy organizations, and lead agencies. Since 2011, LSS has been providing life sharing services, or host homes as we call it at LSS. This is a relationship-based living arrangement that carefully matches a person with a disability with an individual or family who opens their home, shares their experience with the person they support. Life sharing is a proven model, and research shows that by living with a family, a person with disabilities has the opportunity to participate in all desired aspects of family and community life. In comparison to other service settings, people who live in host homes have more outcomes present in the following areas. People have the best possible health, people experience continuity and security, people participate, interact, and are integrated into their community, and people realize their goals. We respectfully request you accept the Senate position, which includes the development of life sharing in consultation with community prior to establishing a reimbursement model. This will allow us to build on our partnership with DHS and co-create a service together that more closely aligns with the widely recognized life sharing service. We are deeply committed to removing barriers to accessing this service and building continued sustainability for providers and Minnesotans with disabilities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. We'll go to Rob and then Will will be the next person. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Hi, uh, Mr. Chairs and members of the committee. Uh, this, my name is Rob Woodlick. I'm a disability advocate and work full time and I'm a business owner. Um, I want to thank you all for allowing me to remote. Um, today I don't have enough home care to um, make it there in person, unfortunately. And I also have to do some work for the paint job I have, which brings me into um, you know, the long overdue uh, MAUPD reform. And uh, we really want to thank both, both committees and this mutual committee for supporting um, this and the Senate inclusion on the Senate omnibus bill. Um, you know, Minnesota employed paid people with disabilities reform. This, we're really looking to um, remove a lot of barriers for people uh, with disabilities and um, contribute to be a part of our community. Um, it will it'll improve all of Minnesota, including people beyond um, disability, living people living with disabilities. Um, you know, just in a in a wrap up, you know, we're looking to, you know, eliminate the premiums, eliminate the asset limits, um, and uh, do a lot of other administrative reforms that are long overdue. Uh, last week, I, I had some snafus with the program and that will be fixed with this reform, uh, hopefully. And, um, you know, it, it just, it's another thing that discourages me from working. So. Uh, this impacts me, myself daily and a lot of others. Um, you know, a lot of these people, well, everyone on this program, we're, we're paying more taxes, we're providing back into the system too. And um, we're, I, have, I pay private insurance premiums. And it's, you know, we're, we're doing what you, everyone else in the state that has a job is doing. Um, and so we urge the House uh, to accept the Senate's position on this program. I, I also want to thank both committees for uh, including the PCA College Service Corps. Uh, that program will hopefully allow me to be there in person next year. Um, so um, thank you for supporting Minnesotans living with disabilities. Thank you, Rob. Um, will, and also will be followed by Ms. Scullin and also Ms. Dowell, if they will come close by. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Of course. Good morning, Chairman Noor and the House and Senate conferees for the time today. My name is William Lykin, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Sober Homes. We support the Senate's version of this bill and appreciate it. However, the bill House File 2847, while well-intentioned, is not ready for prime time and puts the people we serve in jeopardy of losing vital sober housing options. Let me explain. 
First, DHS has not produced the final report due to the legislature in September of last year. Second, vital questions still have not been answered regarding what DHS considers public funds in sober housing. Third, the cost of compliance put forth in this section may price out many residents and sober home operators, therefore greatly reducing access to sober housing during an opioid crisis. We have support from major stakeholders to pause, reflect, and work together in collaboration with DHS and all interested parties to return a better bill for your consideration next session. In closing, this section included in the House is not ready for prime time. Why rush when DHS has not even produced a report, let alone given the public time to review? We request that you table this section of the bill. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Cullen. Welcome to the committee. And Ms. Thal, you can proceed, please. Introduce thank you, yourself. Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, my name is Carrie Thurlow, President and CEO of Leading Age Minnesota, here on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. I want to start my remarks with a moment of gratitude for the support for home and community-based services through the funding of increased elderly waiver reimbursements. Our memberships include the full spectrum of care for long-term care. And this is a, a program that we have advocated for some time, and we are very appreciative. Uh, but I want to spend the bulk of my time sharing with you the findings of the most recent survey that we conducted in April, highlighting the need to do more for nursing homes than what is currently represented um, in, in either bill, but in particular, um, really refuting why um, something needs to be done beyond VBR, um, the VBR solution that is included in the House Omnibus Bill. In April, we surveyed our members, and I want to share some of the most concerning findings with you today. We found that every day, 450 referrals are denied by nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Each denial represents a senior and a family that is unable to receive care in their community. This data represents that nursing homes specifically have seen a 44% rise in the number of denied admissions since we surveyed last October. Nursing facilities located in the Twin Cities, Southeast, West, Central um, have the highest number of denials. The same survey asked our members about their financial position, and these responses are ones that we do not bring to you lightly. 12.2% of greater Minnesota nursing homes are considering closure, 5.9% of nursing homes in the seven county metro are considering closure, and these numbers do not include the closures of two nursing homes that occurred in the last 30 days. The number of nursing facilities that report that they have exhausted their reserves has increased from 5% to 15%, um, which means that they do not have money to wait. The proposed solutions um, that are represented particularly in the House omnibus, omnibus, omnibus Bill ask nursing homes to wait more than 21 months to um, see relief, and this, this data shows that more needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kula. Welcome, and please proceed. Thank you. Um, members of the committee, I'm Patty Cullen, uh, President and CEO of Care Providers in Minnesota, the other half of the long-term care imperative. Just following up from the, the data that Ms. Thurlow shared with all of you, I think we've been before your committees before, talking about the spent down reserves, talking about borrowing from local banks, and that situation certainly hasn't improved. The data shows that it has gotten worse, and that's why we did an updated survey, is to figure out, was our pulse correct? Is it still getting worse, can they wait for the forecast to catch up to current costs? And the answer is no. So we know that members have spent on reserve. We know they're spending beyond what they're getting in their rates today, and they will spend far beyond what they're getting in their rates tomorrow because they have no choice. They have to have workers to take care of the people in their buildings. So in addition to denying access, they have to raise the wages. They have to pay temporary workers because they have people in their buildings who require 24-7 care. They have no choice. They have been deficit spending. So they'll tell us, we have made some bad business decisions. We have increased wages to keep the staff because we need people to do the care. So we need to understand that the data is real, the denied admissions is real. People are still admitting, but there's many facilities that aren't admitting at all, and there's many facilities that are saying, based on the staffing levels I have today, I can't take care of these people who are coming my way. Denied admissions means people are not getting the care they need from their home community, and hospitals are backed up. Again, 
Forecasted increases represent past payments, not current or future money. It's projected growth based on past expenditures. And our data trend line reaffirms our strong position and our strong belief why we're before you today. We cannot wait for future forecasts to catch up because too many facilities will close and too many beds will close and access will become an ever-growing problem for our frail seniors. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Ms. Collin. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Uh, we have uh, Trep followed by Jeremy Hanson wills and also Matt. So if you can get close by, we'll please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. We're gonna get close here. I'm Phoebe Trepp, Executive Director of Claire Housing. Thank you so much for having us here today. The current status in HIV services is that services and prevention are being cut across Minnesota. HIV is a lifelong condition. We know what's needed. We need testing, we need lifelong housing, and we need lifelong treatment. At Claire, we house and serve 300 people living with HIV or AIDS, and we have a wait list of over 400 people. We're in the midst in Minnesota of the first ever declared outbreak of HIV. Not just one, but two outbreaks in this state. The Minnesota legislature has an increased funding to HIV services since the mid-1990s, which is why we're here today asking you to support the House budget proposal that gets us closer to $24 million to help us stay whole as HIV service providers. So far, due to these cuts that have taken place, which are related to the Ryan White federally funded program, one entire program at Claire Housing has been cut, which is directly there to serve people who are associated with the HIV outbreak. Last week, another quarter of our case management was cut, resulting in the loss of a housing services position that serves 36 people to get and maintain housing. Our residents are highly vulnerable people who would otherwise be homeless and likely would become detectable with their HIV, meaning that they could transmit it to others. So we know it's needed, testing, treatment, housing, and prevention, and we're hoping for your support to get close to the house bill numbers. Without it, we know hundreds of people will lose services and we will absolutely lose ground on fighting the HIV epidemic. Thank you so much for having us here and for at least getting us to the table. We are just so excited that both the House and Senate have us in their bills. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, the next person is Jeremy. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Jeremy Hansen Willis. I'm the CEO of Rainbow Health. And I join my colleague today in support of the funding that is both in the House and the Senate for HIV care and prevention with a strong preference for the House position of $24 million. Founded in 1983 as the Minnesota AIDS Project, Rainbow Health was Minnesota's first organization to fight AIDS. For 40 years, we have provided a comprehensive array of housing, mental health, transportation, financial assistance, and other services to more than 2,300 people each year who are living with HIV across Minnesota, more than two-thirds of whom are low-income and people of color. The vast majority of these services are funded by the Wine White program, which my colleague just told you is facing steep cuts at DHS. Without the legislative funding in your bill, Rainbow Health faces a cut totaling $1.2 million, on top of the already $400,000 we received earlier this year, which forced us to scale back six of our programs, including rental assistance, legal assistance, and transportation to help people with HIV get to their doctor. Of the new cuts that will occur without additional funding, 700,000 pays for financial assistance to low-income people living with HIV. This means in the first two months alone, 1,500 people will lose food support, another 400 will go without rental assistance or help for paying for basic necessities like utilities and medical bills. This means more vulnerable people living with HIV will go unfed, unhoused, and unable to pay their medical bills. It means that more people with HIV will see their viral loads increase, leading to more disease and death from a virus that is preventable and treatable. And what is truly disheartening about these severe budget cuts is the reality that the tools exist to end HIV in Minnesota. 
other states have made more significant progress in reducing new HIV infections and more successfully connect those living with HIV to life-saving care. Meanwhile, as my colleague said, in Minnesota, HIV outbreaks have been occurring in Minneapolis and Duluth. By approving the House position of 24 million, you will help put Minnesota on a much better path to the realistic goal of ending HIV in Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, followed by Matt. And if Cherie, um, Brianna, and Fatima can be ready, please proceed. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Matt Toburin, he, him, Executive Director of the Aliveness Project, a community center serving people living with and at risk for HIV and AIDS. <clears throat> Today, somewhere in Minnesota, a young person will learn the news that they were just diagnosed with HIV. Tragically, almost every day, someone in our state receives this news. For the first time in the history of the epidemic, the Minnesota Department of Health has declared an official HIV outbreak with over 120 new cases in the Twin Cities in Duluth. And have we not been living through another global pandemic, this would and should be front page news. On top of this unprecedented outbreak and compounding our problem, we face deep federal budget cuts to HIV services. And as a result of these cuts, our organization is cutting back 20% of our support for those who need it the most. And it doesn't have to be this way. We have the knowledge and we have the tools to reach an end of HIV in Minnesota. What we've lacked is the funding and the political will to achieve this goal until now. This session, both the Minnesota House and Senate made historic investments in HIV care and prevention. These funds will stop harmful cuts and provide evidence-based, data-driven interventions to provide, to provide care and support to disproportionately impacted communities. The House HIV services funding of 24 million is critical to achieving the needed impact. We ask you today to adopt the House funding level. 2023 can mark the turning point in our fight against HIV. The 2023 legislature will go down in history as making bold and transformative investments that change the course of the epidemic. Thank you for making this truly historic investment so that tomorrow doesn't look like today. Uh, thank you so much. There's a quick question from uh, Senator Ebro. Yeah, thanks. And again, not for now, but um, I mean, I didn't, these cuts that we're talking about are, are interest, are not, they're concerning to me, that's a better word. Um, but so we did a bunch of one-time funding and some of that's running out. And so um, it would help me to know if this is from that um, and otherwise if there's some other source of cuts. And just so people know, we had all this money that landed in our lap. We tried to find ways to spend it a couple of years ago, knowing it was only one time. And so... If people build programs on one-time money, then that's helpful to know, and I'm sorry for the effects of that, but just it's a worthy discussion, and so offline it would help me to understand that. And we have to decide, Mr. Chair, in our budgets, what do you want to continue and what not, and there's proposals from both sides about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. I think we'll have more conversation on that, so appreciate the testifiers. We'll, we'll continue because there's, a, there's also a cliff because of the loss of federal funds, so we'll talk more. Um, we have uh, Cherie coming up, and then Brianna, get ready, and Fatima. Good morning. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning and thank you um, for having me here this morning to testify. My name is Sherry Pugh and I'm the chair of Age Friendly Minnesota Council. I'm here to urge you to support the language in House Bill 2934 regarding the Age Friendly Council and our grants. Recognizing that the demographic change has occurred in Minnesota in December 2019, Governor Waltz signed an executive order establishing the state age-friendly council. The age-friendly is a collaborative statewide effort to make our systems and communities more inclusive and responsive to older adults. 
The council is comprised of leaders from nine state agencies, representatives from Greater Minnesota, faith communities, BIPOC, GLBT, and other communities representing elders, as well as the tribal nations of Minnesota. In 2021, the legislature authorized um, an extension of the council and the funding of our age-friendly community and technical assistance grants. We put out the RFP for those grants this year. While we only had $1.4 million, we had $9 million in request from communities all over the state showing the engagement, the interest, and the need to address aging in our communities. Many of those communities and townships were less than 1,000 people and over 50% of them were first time applicants for a state grant. In 2022, Governor Waltz also signed an edict that had Minnesota join as the 10th state, a national uh, network of aging states. The council is focused on advancing age-friendly policies while coordinating state, local, and private partners, collaborative work on the emergency preparedness for older adults in our communities. We also are, in response to the demographic shifts, we are working on a multi-sector blueprint for aging in Minnesota. We want Minnesotans to age positively in our state. The benefits of achieving an age-friendly Minnesota include coordinated public and private sector actions to address shared priorities um, developed with and for older adults. And so we hope that you will consider the language in the House bill in your final conference bill. And I say to all of you, I know some of you are young, but probably within 30 years, all of you will be part of the aging cohort of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. P, for your uh, testimony. Uh, we appreciate that. So, Brianna, if you can get close by and then followed by Fatima. Oh, you wanted Fatima to go ahead. She's already yes, sitting. Go ahead, Ms. Ms. Mollas. Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, and the committee members. My name is Fatima Mollas. I am a co-founder of the Multicultural Autism Action Network, a nonprofit organization that serves autistic children and their families in our Somali and Oromo communities. I'm also the parent of an autistic child. I'm here today to say thank you for your support of people with disabilities. We know everyone sitting on this committee is here because they care about people with disabilities. We know that you are in the process of making a difficult decisions about how to prioritize human services budget. I'm also here to talk to you and ask you to support lifting the 40-hour cap on parent pay and about the parental fees that parents of children with, with disabilities pay to act, access TEFRA and home and community-based services. There's a myth that this is an issue that only affects rich families. I'm here today to tell you that's not the case. Parental fees begin at an annual income of about uh, around 55000 per year for a family of three. So this is an issue that affects many middle-income families. And what happens to these families if they cannot afford the fees? Many choose to go without services because they, they are too expensive. We know that there's a strong evidence that earlier, the earlier a child with disability receives services and support, the more likely they, have, they are to have improved outcomes. Our families in our community face many obstacles to obtaining early intervention services for their children with their, with their disabilities, but these fees should not be one of them. It is true that many families we serve qualify for income-based medical assistance, but as more families begin to climb the economic ladder, this is yet another obstacle in their path. We have heard many stories from, uh, about families who turn down opportunities to work because they want to make sure their income never goes over the threshold for the parental fees. Can you imagine saying no to a promotion, saying no to a new job opportunity, or, say, or, ta or not taking a job at all out of the fear of paying for, uh, the fear that these fees that you have to pay. We recognize that there are many different programs and services to complete the resource, to compete the resources, but it's time to make sure these parental fees are a thing of the past. I respectfully ask you to include the parental elimination fee, elimination provisions in your final omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mollis, for your testimony. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, welcome. Uh, the next person that we have is Ms. Lindell. W welcome to the committee. Please in introduce yourself and proceed. Members of the Human Service Conference Committee, 
My name is Brianna Lindell, and I'm the Regulatory Affairs and Advocacy Manager for the Minnesota Home Care Association. Our members provide hands-on care to approximately 40,000 Minnesotans with disabilities and complex health conditions in their home. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today on the home care investments proposed in the House and Senate Human Service Ominous Bills. The Minnesota Home Care Association greatly appreciates the funding both the House and Senate propose for home care services, specifically the proposals for increased investments in homemaking services, home health and home care nursing, and the PCA program. These investments are significant steps forward in addressing the foundational reimbursement rate challenges that are so significantly impacting access to needed home care services for Minnesotans. We especially appreciate the Senate's proposed level of investments in home health and home care nursing and urge the conference committee to adapt that proposal. Additionally, the significant investments proposed by each body for the PCA program are much appreciated and much needed. However, we do need to express again how critical it is that the proposed investments are raised to a level sufficient to cover the SEIU contract. The staff who provide skilled nursing and related services in people's own homes, the most cost-effective setting, are underpaid and undervalued. We as a state can and must do better. The home care proposals under consideration by this conference committee represent your understanding of that, and we thank you. As you complete your deliberations in the coming days and weeks, we strongly urge you to champion the significant home care investments needed to better support older Minnesotans with disabilities and complex care needs. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Cynthia. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself, uh, followed by Dr. Hess, if you can get close by. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Cynthia Calais, and I'm the Public Policy Coordinator with the Minnesota Brain Injury Alliance. I want to start by thanking you for the tremendous investment in our human services system that you are making with these bills. We can all see the disability service crisis in front of us, and this conference committee has an important role in its solution. We are excited and pleased to see the large investment in direct support workers and the service provider network that you make. These are people and organizations that provide much needed care for people with disabilities. This is a complex problem and we appreciate these historic investments. In addition to improving the system, we also must make comprehensive progress in addressing the day-to-day -day issues that people with disabilities face. As we have mentioned before, truly improving the lives of Minnesotans who live with disabilities must go deeper than improving commuter systems, adding FTEs to agencies, improving rates, and providing incentives for employment and caregiving. We must create a more equitable medical assistance program. So we want to thank you for including funding to address the MA income limit for people with disabilities in the Senate omnibus bill. While we don't know what impact this has on the spend down percentage wise, we know that this $10 million is directly proportional to dollars that we are taking out of people with disabilities pockets. The cost of raising the spend down to be equitable with other categories and removing the asset limit is over $850 million. People with disabilities and the elderly face the lowest income standards out of all the ca categories of MA, while also facing a $3,000 asset limit. Now is the time to move the needle and give people work, hope. This investment will have a direct impact on so many Minnesotans, and I urge you to continue this progress and fight to ensure it stays in the bill and is ultimately signed into law. We can't continue to leave them behind. Please accept the la Senate language, and thank you for your significant investments and efforts to address the inequity in our MA system. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, Dr. Hess. Please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself while you are testifying. Uh, the next person, I think I will let um, um, Representative Beck after Dr. Hess uh, testify. Yeah. Please, ready to go. Hello. Good morning, uh, Chair Huffman, Chair Noor, and the committee. I appreciate you giving me this time today. I'm Dr. Todd Hess. I'm a pain specialist, Mayo-trained, board-certified anesthesiologist, and board-certified pain management specialist. I ran a pain center just down the hill from us here for 31 years as a director. I strongly believe in the multimodal care plan of patients, and we were one of the first centers to have both addiction, psychologic support, OTPT, acupuncture, biofeedback, chiropractic, non-opioid care plans, and injections. I'm here, though, to talk about the opioid crisis. I certainly have witnessed this since my residency at Mayo and Fellowship. The pendulum has swung multiple directions. Unfortunately, it's now swung in the other direction. There was a crisis indeed, absolutely. But phys physician prescribing is down now by approximately 60%, while illicit fentanyl overdoses are up 
Unfortunately, what happened is this OPIT program had a chilling effect on those of us who try to help patients who have chronic pain. And that is what I'm here today to talk about. We have been pressed over and over again with guidelines which have no medical basis. CDC, DHS, and OPIP have given us guidelines of trying to get to a special number of opioid, which is that MME90, which actually has no literature validity. That's very clear in the literature, so another thing we've learned. So we need to be able to make certain patients can have the meds they need. If not, us doctors have actually been uh, told that we would be, if we didn't meet these criteria, we'd be disenrolled, decredentialed, and unable to write pain meds any longer. This simply is intolerable. I'm also from a small town in Minnesota called Staples. We're a small in Todd County. Also, I'm afraid primary care doctors are not going to be able to prescribe with some of these new rules, and we know they do excellent work. We need to support the physicians. We need to support patients. I therefore ask you to follow the uh, sunsetting of OPIP in the Senate. I'm also asking you to not do the waivers, to not do sanctions. Many of you I've spoken to have family members with pain. Don't forget those of us with chronic pain. The AMA, the MMA, the American Association of Anesthesiologists, and American College of Oncologists all agree these guidelines are not necessary. They're actually unhelpful. And even the CDC itself has issued strong warnings in 2019 that these guidelines have damaged people. And I believe OPIP has in this state also. Once again, thank you last year for your support for our chronic pain bill. Please remember not to forget those of us who have chronic pain. There are 2.5 million Americans with substance use disorder, but we cannot ignore the 50 million Americans, those of us who suffer from chronic pain. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hess. Um, Representative Baker. Uh, Mr. Yes, Chair. Know the next Mr. Chair and members, again, uh, Dr. Prescott was uh, scheduled to be here today. Uh, he was not able to be here, but he did submit a letter, which I now have sent over to the committee administrator. Um, to be added to the testimony. I just wanted to just summarize very, very quickly. Um, Dr. Prescott is a member of the Opioid Epidemic Advisory Council, which I'm the chair of. Um, he's been a valued member of, of that council from the beginning about three years ago. And he just, again, he's got a position on the considering the makeup of the ORAC council, uh, changing a little bit to uh, the governor's request. And his, again, while I recognize, uh, and I quote from his letter here, uh, while I recognize each of our 11 Minnesota tribes to be their own nation and support the tribal sovereignty. ORAC membership was designed with equal tribal representation for both Ojibwe and Dakota citizens. Uh, before we have a council that becomes too large to manage, I suggest we look at alternatives to enlarging the committee. Uh, here are some options to gain additional tribal input. The, it's in the letter. I think he's got some really good ideas, Mr. Chair. Um, and again, as the chair of ORAC myself, I think this is really spot on to, to represent, uh, Dr. Prescott represents all the Dakota, which is a four, four of the tribes. Um, and I also have Nicole Anderson who represents uh, the Ojibwe tribes on the council. So more to come, but I think this letter is very helpful to us to try to find a solution. So I wanted to add that to testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baker. I think the, uh, the letter is in our packets uh, for those who want to read. So. Uh, we have Ellen Weidenhoff and then Jeremy Drecker, if you can come close by, followed by Musa Khalif. Chairs Neuer, Hoffman, and members of the committee. My name is Ellen Wiederhoff. I'm a PCA living in Minneapolis, and I'm here representing my union, SEIU Healthcare Minnesota and Iowa. I began working in home care over seven years ago, and I now work as a primary PCA for an amazing 11-year-old, Zoe. She is smart, strong, opinionated, and she requires assistance with most aspects of her daily life. But like so many Minnesotans, Zoe's family can't find enough workers to cover the open shifts. So I want to thank both the House and the Senate for ratifying the recent SEIU PCA contract. Your bills increase the minimum wage from $15.25 to $20 an hour over two years, provide a $1,000 retention bonus for committed workers, and create a wage scale for experienced workers. We encourage you to adopt the House funding, which is larger than the governor and Senate positions. The contract will allow Zoe to find the workers she needs, and it just might allow me to make my dream of a career in home care a reality. Thank you to both bodies for including language on PCA's driving, and we ask that you add the Senate pr provisions to improve Direct Support Connect and increase parent spouse hours in CFSS and CDCS. The current staffing crisis affects all of home care, which is why both legislative bodies added nursing home funding. We encourage you to adopt 
the Senate's funding position and suggest that you fund a uniform statewide system of retention bonuses. When combined with the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board, this investment will help our nursing home workers. Both bodies also provide one-time funding for the governor's long-term care workforce grants for new Americans. While we would prefer ongoing funding, we encourage you to adopt the House position of $40.8 million. Our members at Rainbow Health encourage you to adopt the $24.2 million House position for HIV funding. Our members at Bayview Nursing Home in Red Wing encourage you to adopt the larger Senate position for a specific facility rate increase. And our members at Access Minnesota encourage you to adopt the Senate position to increase rates for intermediate care facilities. Finally, our union supports the House position to phase out the sub-minimum wage. Thank you for your time. Please see the letter we submitted, and thank you for these great bills. Thank you so much for your testimony. Mr. Director, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Mr. Musab Khalif, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairs and committee members. My name is Jeremy Drucker, and I serve as the Addiction and Recovery Director for the Walls Administration. First, I'd like to thank both the House and the Senate for not only including the Governor's proposal for a permanent Office of Addiction and Recovery, but by adding a position to that proposal to focus on youth as well. The, that funding is going to provide a strong platform for the work of the Subcabinet on Substance Use. Secondly, I'd like to just emphasize the need around substance use funding. The overdose and substance use crisis nationwide and in Minnesota is continuing unabated, and drug overdoses have increased exponentially over the last several years. The drugs on the street today are more dangerous than they've ever been, and we need to take new approaches to protect Minnesotans and give them a chance at treatment and recovery. In particular, the advent of xylazine, an animal tranquilizer found along with fentanyl, is increasing the danger to our communities. The investments up for discussion in this bill will not only help prevent overdoses, substance misuse, and help those struggling with SUD, but are part of a comprehensive public safety response to issues we are seeing around encampments, on public transit, and on our streets. I've had the opportunity to talk to members of law enforcement, uh, and they all say that we cannot arrest our way out of this issue. They are looking for answers and want us to try something, anything, to help them with this seemingly intractable problem. Specifically, the governor's rec for safe, recommendation for safe recovery sites can play a significant role in addressing some of these issues, offering individuals living outside a place to feel secure, get help with their substance use, and connect them to other critical services like health care and supportive housing. Thank you all for your work on this bill and for the opportunity to testify on the budget. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Khalif, before you proceed, uh, I just wanted to invite uh, Wendy Jones, Julie Johnson, and Tom Weaver to get close by. Please proceed. Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, and esteemed members of the conference committee. My name is Musab Khalif, and I'm with the Minnesota First Provider Alliance. I'm here today to tell you that the PCA program is on the brink of collapsing, and we are looking to this conference committee to provide the additional funding required to save it. The PCA program is a critical lifeline for 44,000 clients and employs approximately 60,000 caregivers. The MHCA recently surveyed its members regarding the impact of passing the PCA rate proposal without additional funding, and the survey findings were appalling. 40% of our traditional agencies said they would close, and 60% of our choice agencies said they would close or stop providing PCA choice services. Finally, the remaining PCA providers said they were uncertain of their agency's future. Based on our survey finding, a minimum of 8,000 clients would be impacted upon passage of this bill without additional funding. PCA providers would need a reimbursement rate of $24.42 or an increase of 24.59% above the current law to maintain their current margins. As a reminder, at our current margins, DHS reported that 42 PCA agencies closed in 2022 alone. In contrast, the House's proposal gives us a reimbursement rate of $23.77, or an increase of 21.3% above the current law. Therefore, at minimum, the conference committee must adopt the House PCA rate proposal and strive to bolster it further. The PCA program needs every penny this, con this conference committee can spare to survive to ensure that our state's most vulnerable members still receive the care they need. I would like to thank this conference committee for working so hard with the limited budget they were given to give us the necessary requirement rates. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Jones. Introduce yourself and proceed. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Wendy Jones. I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder and the executive director of Minnesota Recovery Connection, the state's first recovery community organization, or RCO, established in 2010. I'm here on behalf of a broad coalition of RCOs from across the state that are working together as the Minnesota Alliance of Recovery Community Organizations. The item we'd like to draw your attention to is that of peer recovery support services and vendor eligibility for the MA benefit. Currently in statute, treatment providers and RCOs are eligible vendors. We request the following three items of the committee. First, we'd ask that you retain the language regarding recovery community organization best practices from the governor's budget and H1403A8, which passed last week on the House floor in the final bill. This language language was developed through a policy work group that included diverse RCO representation, DHS, and March representatives. It is intended to codify RCO best practices for the purpose of credentialing and subsequently vendor eligibility. Although there is a well-established licensing process that clearly defines and guides the work of treatment providers, RCOs are intentionally non-clinical entities and less well-known or understood, especially in Minnesota. Questions have been raised over the past few years regarding what exactly is an RCO, how does an organization become recognized as an RCO, and how are RCOs held accountable for the ongoing fidelity of their services? This language is intended to answer those questions. Second, we ask that you do not advance the Senate bill language regarding a Board of Recovery Services as a means of determining eligible uh, eligibility. Instead, we ask that you direct DHS to engage peer recovery support service stakeholders, including consumers, in establishing best practices and credentialing criteria for future eligible vendor types, just as we are doing for licensed treatment providers and credentialed RCOs. We support expanding the MA benefit to other vendors. Uh, however, we feel that more work needs to be done to define the front end processes and best practices uh, criteria that any vendor should follow. Finally, we ask that you extend the grace period to retain vendor eligibility for organizations recognized as RCOs by the commissioner, but not otherwise credentialed. Recognizing that there is lingering ambiguity about future RCO credentialing and that alternative vendor eligibility criteria needs to be further defined before next session. We do not want to see any gaps in service. It's reasonable you, to Ms. provide uh, this extension. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. James. Uh, Ms. Jones. Um, Ms. Johnson, please uh, introduce yourself and proceed. Chair Noren, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak briefly today on the bill. I am Julie Johnson. I'm the president of MSS, a nonprofit organization that provides day and employment services to people with disabilities. I'm also the president of MORE, a statewide association of 100 nonprofit organizations that also provide day and employment services to people with disabilities. MORE would like to thank both the House and the Senate for proposed investments in the disability waiver rate system. If passed, these investments will allow for much needed increases in direct support worker wages and benefits. Fixing reimbursement rate challenges is foundational to addressing the current destabilizing workforce shortage and waiver-funded disability services, and we applaud you for recognizing this. We urge the conference committee to adopt the Senate level of funding for DWRS. Specifically, we thank the Senate for proposing to fully fund the competitive workforce factor. The Senate's proposal to raise wage for the employment exploration services is low cost but necessary to help increase people's exposure to competitive integrated employment options. We appreciate the joint proposal from the House and Senate to move up the timing of the next rate adjustments, as well as the critical House proposal to use more current data to inform those future adjustments. I would direct you to the many letters submitted by disability service organizations for further detail on where to find the provisions found in those bills. The decisions that your conference committee will make have the potential to change the current troubling trajectory of waiver-funded disability services. Without meaningful action by the legislature this session to address the outdated reimbursement rates, we will continue to see growing wait lists for day and employment services for people with disabilities, further shrinking of residential supports, and lack of access to the services that people with disabilities need. With meaningful investments now, the legislature can put back Minnesota back on track for being a state that proudly supports Minnesotans with disabilities to live engaged and connected lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, before you begin, Mr. Weave, I just wanted to Kami uh, to get close by and also Laura. 
please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Noor, members of the conference committee. My name is Tom Weaver, and I am the CEO at Achieve Services, a day program located in Blaine. And I'd like to begin by saying I echo everything you just heard from Ms. Johnson and totally support her position. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about uh, a provision in the House bill that would eliminate 14C, or special minimum wage work. Uh, and I just want to make a few quick points on that. Number one is we have a number of people at Achieve who, who do that work, and they do it because they choose to do it. It's always a choice. Everybody who comes to Achieve for services, and we've got over 200 people on a waiting list right now to get into Achieve, everybody who comes is given the choice to work in a job in the community at, in, at competitive pay, or if that's not right for them, they can do uh, 14C work uh, in a safe, supported environment at Achieve. Some people don't want to do any work, so we provide a variety of life-enriching services at Achieve as well. And the reality is most people choose some combination of those different services. Uh, but it's always a choice. And for those who choose 14C work, that choice has to be reaffirmed every year by an independent agency that interviews each person. And they have to uh, make an informed choice, again, to continue doing 14C work. Uh, the second point is eliminating 14C work would absolutely eliminate jobs. Not for everybody. There's no question some people would find jobs in the community, but there are a number of folks, particularly at the higher needs end of the spectrum, that would no longer have jobs. They would not only lose their job, but they'd lose their sense of purpose, their pride of accomplishments, the dignity of work. Uh, all that goes away. What would, what would not go away is the, are the reasons that they chose uh, not to seek uh, community employment to begin with. Again, many of them are uh, very high needs, they're vulnerable adults. They, they and their families are concerned about uh, their vulnerability in the community. Many of them uh, have complex medical issues that make it very difficult for them to keep any kind of schedule. Many of them have anxiety and other mental health issues that make, it, uh, make them unable to function in the community. Uh, many of them uh, are nonverbal, many of them are non-ambulatory, uh, uh, and they choose, instead of working in the community, to work in a safe, supported environment uh, with people they know and they trust. Uh, and finally, the uh, eliminating 14C sends some very bad messages. One of the messages is that our, the people we serve, our participants and their families, are not capable of making the decision of what's best for those folks. Uh, and I can assure you they are absolutely capable of determining what's best for themselves. Uh, the other message it sends Mr. is Mr. that Weaver, if, if you're you not can, working... If you can wrap up your testimony, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Let's absolutely continue working on finding more and better alternatives for employment for people with disabilities, but please do not eliminate one of the options that is working so well for thousands of people in Minnesota. Thanks again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Lavelle, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed. Okay. Chair Noor and members of the committee, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Cami Lavelle. I am here to discuss um, the OPEP provis provisions in addition to the repeal of the sunset. Um, I am asking the committee to oppose the repeal of the sunset for the opioid fees, the increased fees. And one of the reasons is we don't even have a report yet. And if I remember correctly, in statute, that report is not due until next year. And that was the report was to from the Board of Pharmacy to indicate and to show if we've had any unintended consequences, collateral damage, negative ramifications, which we already have. So why not wait till the report is due before we make that decision? So I would I support the Senate's version as far as that because it's not repealing that sunset. I think that's very important. It has negatively impacted me because my prescription costs have gone up. I am a pain patient. I'm a rare disease patient. I have medically necessary opioids prescribed to me. I have also been forced tapered starting in 2019. I have testified in front of the conference committees. The first time was May 6, 2019. I also lost my doctor because he was being threatened um, by letters and he felt threatened by DHS. He felt threatened by many different entities. So I was on palliative care. I'm exempt from all the guidelines. I was still being tapered. I lost my provider in June. It took me till January to find somebody to take care of me and continue prescribing. And I will wrap it up by saying I support the OPIP sunset. It's in both of the versions, but I am asking you 
for the Senate version. And I am very concerned about the sanction language and the waiver language because historically, what happened with DHS, OPIP, and the Opiate Prescribing Work Group, there was not a pain management physician on that group. There was not pain patients on the group until 2021 officially, and it dissolved the end of 2021. It was an unbalanced group, and if it was balanced, I don't think we'd be in this situation. So I am asking you to oppose the fees, and I am supporting the sunset of OPIP. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you, um, Ms. Johnson. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Please introduce yourself and proceed. I'm sorry. Uh, um, overdose epidemic in America has reached proportions we've never seen before yet. Chronic pain patients are not part of that equation anymore because we're being denied relief medications. I once had a very full life. I gardened. I played with my granddaughters. I worked. I've held, I've held a job since I was 12 years old. I worked for 45, 47 years for my golden years. And now I get to live like this because of untreated pain. I can't breathe. My lungs are affected because the pain is constant. So my body is reacting with shaking, and I can't take in enough oxygen. To me, this is legalized torture. Uh, nobody should ever have to endure pain so bad you can't sit still. The suicide rate among chronic patients is of 65% from last year alone. Two weeks ago, we said goodbye to a, a warrior and an advocate fought very hard. She called it rational suicide. And her physician helped her cross because she could not live another day in agony. I can't find another word for it. Um, she had a very complex case, but now she's not suffering anymore. So now states are looking at end-of-life options. Rather than giving us the medications to enjoy living, they're giving us options to die. Um, and I had that experience with me in May of last year. My son had an ambulance pick me up after 13 hours of vomiting. He took me to the emergency room at Fairview, where they said, oh, we can't do anything. We're opioid-free. We can give you something for the vomiting and give you fluids. It was pain. I didn't even know what could I have. And uh, the whole back of my head felt like it was going to explode. And I begged the doctor, I remember grabbing his hand and I begged him to just use and ask me, just, just get it over with because I can't take it. I was sent home for four days. I lived in a dark room. My vomiting was controlled, but I couldn't eat or drink anything because it would get, I'd get sick from it. But the pain was so bad. I just had to lay there and rock in a fetal position until it would go away. And it took me two weeks to recover from that. I don't know what the, the settlement money is targeted for opioid use disorder. Well, what is that? Is that treatment? You know, is there anything for people like us? Nothing. There are no resources for us out there. We're dumped. I was dumped by my doctor in February of 2022. I just got a doctor last month. Nobody wanted to touch my case. I have been living in constant 24-7 pain. I'm eating Tylenol and Advil by the handfuls to the point now my liver is not functioning normally. I mean, I, well, how much more can a human being take? I can't take anymore. And I know thousands of people reaching out for help. This is just not fair. The intractable pain bill was a became law last year, and I thank you for that. But DHS 
and the governor never even acknowledged it. We have doctors in this state who don't even know about it. Where the medical board can't come after them. They don't even know about the intractable pain bill. I, I make copies and mail them out. I, I send them to people and they're like, why weren't we told about this? Doctors can prescribe, but they don't know that they can. They're targeted by the medical board, they're targeted by DEA, as they call those predators. They should be jailed for what they're doing to the doctors. Shame on them. I, I, I'm sorry, I take this very seriously. I've been advocating for, for five years for people who are hurting. I, I, I'm tired of hurting. I would like to enjoy my life, it, what, whatever I can get from it. I want to play with my granddaughters, and I can't do any of this. I want to say one more thing. My son committed suicide in 2000, it was June 20th, 2018. He suffered from addiction too. He suffered from alcoholism and gambling. I'm not out there parading myself saying, close the casinos, ban alcohol. Because you know what? I'd be laughed at. We're easy targets because we're the most vulnerable group of people to pick on because we can't fight back. We're physically disabled. We're broken, we're beaten down, and we wear a label slapped on our back that we're narcotic users. I'm not kidding you. I, I've been called every name in the book because I've had to use this for my multiple sclerosis. I'm not ashamed to call it narcotics or opioids. I don't care what you call it, but it, we need it. I'm sorry, I'm going too long. I'm sorry. I am sorry I'm taking too long. I'm just pretty passionate. I'm fighting for thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for your testimony and sharing your story with us. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. We'll keep on listening. We've got more work to do. Thank so you. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, Senator Edmund. Well, just really briefly, Ms. Johnson, we hear you. Thank you for coming today. You uh, bring tears to my eyes, and God bless you. And we hope we can do something to help you and people like you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the uh, next on the list is uh, AJ, Abdurrahman, and Zev. If you can come to the testifying table and uh, please. Uh, Mr. Orsame, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, my name is Abdurrahman Orsame. I'm a person in long-term recovery, um, so I'm going to be here alone today. Uh, my colleagues could not make it. Um, so um, my name is Abdurrahman Orsame. Um, I'm Somali-American, born and raised here in Minnesota, and I am the co-founder of an organization called Generation Hope. Uh, I come from a, a marginalized community and um, neighborhood called Cedar Riverside. Um, I dealt with fentanyl addiction in my life, and um, I lost a lot of friends because of it. Um, and me and my friends, we started an organization in uh, 2019 to uh, raise awareness in our community um, because people were dying and nobody knew how to deal with it. Uh, parents would come and find their children dead in their rooms um, and not know what to do. And they would tell people that, um, that, that their children died from a heart attack or that they died in their sleep, or that they died from COVID in 2020 and ongoing because uh, of shame and stigma. Um, and as time went on, um, we continued. We continued to try to raise awareness, uh, but people kept dying. Um, since then, we've been growing uh, in raising awareness and been fighting the fight. But the biggest issue that we've come across is that there isn't any culturally specific services, right? It, it's a big lack when it comes to funding. There's people that are overdosing every day, and there's no data behind it, right? People in our community are suffering, and it's being swept under the rug. And there's not enough funding, not enough support, right? And not enough community. And it's killing us. We are suffering in silence. We need support from the community. We need support from our elected officials, right? And without that, we'll continue to suffer. So please, please support us. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, the next group on the list is uh, Marion Jinhoff and then uh, former representative Sandel, uh, if you can get close by. Welcome and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Jean Hoff. I use distorted decision making to make my choice by my life. I am deciding about college, my career, where I live, and who I vote for. Sometimes I need help like anyone else. I like to understand my options. Making my own decision is empowering. A lot of many citizens with disabilities do not know about this burden decision making. They need to know all their choice. They need to know who can help. I believe everyone has the right to make their own decisions and use this product decision making. Please get conclude this product decision making in your final conference report. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you. Um, Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, and conference committee members, my name is Mary Hoff. Today I'm advocating for supported decision making provisions that are part of the Senate File 2934. Before Jean turned 18, I learned about and encouraged Jean to consider supported decision making as the alternative to guardianship. She did not hesitate. Supported decision making is vital right size support that gives Jean the space to make informed decisions and live the independent life that she wants. Had it not been for our family's bandwidth to advocate, Jean would be under guardianship. This is a case for many Minnesotans with a disability and their families who do not have access to supported decision making information or services. Minnesota's current statute requires consideration of less restrictive alternatives to guardianship. However, this does not guarantee that Minnesotans with a disability, their families, or trusted service providers know about supported decision making. State grants through DHS will provide critical funding to organizations with expertise in supported decision making. It will lead to more informed choice and independence for persons with disabilities and align with so many other DHS values and services. I ask that the conference committee adopts the Senate position and includes the supported decision making provisions and funding in the final conference committee report. Thank you. Th thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, before I invite uh, former representative, I just wanted to make sure Josh and also Chakaya Richmond, if you can get close by. Chair Noor, uh, Chair Hoffman, uh, minority leads, uh, members and uh, staff. My name is Steve Sandell. I'm a resident of Woodbury and a former member of this committee. I appreciate the chance to have spoken with you earlier this session about the Minnesota Sex Offender Program. It's a complex, difficult, yet flawed program administered by DHS. MSOP has been the subject of disparaging reviews in professional journals, national media, two critical audits, and an unresolved court action. We've spent a billion dollars on a program that has no statistical effect reducing sexual aggression and assault in Minnesota. Yet there is no regular independent assessment of the program. It continues to be the largest per capita and the most expensive of its kind in the country. The number of individuals incarcerated, now 750, continues to rise, while the average length of stay is the longest in the country and lengthening every day. 98 individuals have died there in nearly 30 years. Only 17 have been released. Commitment looks like a life sentence. I know that issues dealing with sex-related crimes are sensitive and that malicious assault and aggression leave lasting pain and trauma with its victims. But this program, costing more than $100 million a year, helps neither victims nor those eager and able to reform and heal. Before you pass this bill out of committee, 
please consider our amendment that would suspend its MSOP allotment until 2024 session, giving members time to learn from current research, agency personnel, victims, and patients before endorsing this current program. That may seem like an intrusive inconvenience, but let me remind you that we're talking about protecting the lives of potential victims and healing the lives of others while serving the public safety and public health. The legislature established MSOP and uh, only you can turn its effects toward preventing sexual aggressions, paying attention to issues of mental health and leading to assault, supporting victims, searching for the most effective treatment, and revisiting the process of commitment and reintegration. Thanks very much for your attention to this compelling issue, and I hope that we can make uh, progress together on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and the next person on the list is Mr. Berg, and please uh, proceed. And I just also wanted to call Apple close to the testify table. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Josh Berg uh, with Accessible Space, Inc., uh, here to make one last pitch uh, for considering reimbursing the critical nursing services within the ICS framework uh, that was authored by Senator Fateh uh, with co-authors Hoffman Enabler and then in the House, uh, Representative Curran, uh, Curran with uh, co-authors Knorr and Fisher. Uh, I even dressed up for today, uh, hearing Chair Hoffman's pure elation yesterday uh, when House members wore ties and, and looked nice in the Senate chamber. So. I've tried to be persistent, uh, sometimes perhaps even annoying. My apologies, Kevin and Sean. Uh, so today I figured I'd try appealing to Chair Hoffman's excitement for ties. Uh, not going to repeat everything you've heard me say over the past handful of months, but I do want to highlight a few key items for you to think about during these final negotiations. A reminder that this language in Senate File 1009 and House File 14, 1416 is not new language and is really attempting to build a bridge between what was already reimbursed under customized living or would be reimbursed by CRS. It is not attempting to add new services that are, aren't already reimbursed by similar models or similar supported licensure, aka this is fixing an issue uh, as ICS was created and implemented a gap that exists. ICS has been called the replacement for customized living for the individuals under 55 on CADI and BI, and as it sits right now, it's the light version uh, in some regards that only includes bits and pieces that were once required and reimbursed. Needs and supports of the individuals that we have supported uh, have not changed because we switched licenses or models, uh, and this is going to potentially create more access issues uh, to individuals with disabilities on CADI and BI uh, moving into the future. The fiscal, fiscal cost to adding RN services to ICS is a fraction of the cost of many other components of these uh, omnibus bills. We don't know exactly uh, the cost uh, because my understanding is that as of today, the department has not provided the requested fiscal note to the chairs of the respected committees related to this language, um, but we were able to put, pull together some data, uh, shared it with the committee uh, earlier today that it would be in the ballpark of $6 million per year, $12 million per biennium uh, to fix this gap. This represents what less than one half of 1% of the total new spending targets. So as you find uh, some additional millions of dollars in the couch cushions this week and in the coming days, uh, and or when agreement cannot be found in certain components uh, of this large omnibus bill, I just simply ask you to consider finding space for this critical language. Thank you for the time today and over the past few months, it's been an honor working alongside many of you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Richmond, followed by Apple Sota, if you can come close by, please. Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Shakaya Richmond. I'm the owner of Healing Homes Living Services, an assisted living facility here in St. Paul. I also sit on the board of directors for RPAMN. First, I want to thank the chair. First, I want to thank Chair Hoffman and Chair Knorr for taking the time to work on and address the financial struggles that customized living providers serving individuals on the CAD and BI waivers have been facing since being left out of the 2021 HCBS rate increases. Both bills advance the processes of phasing in the rate framework in, the two, in, in Chapter 256S, but it's the House bill that fully implements the payment method, methodology that RPA strongly supports. We believe it's important that providers serving folks on the CAD and BI waivers are treated the same as those serving individuals on the, e, on the EW waiver. Secondly, RPA MN appreciates the efforts in both bills to improve the moratorium exception process for providers seeking the community residential setting or the CSR program. 
We've been working with DHS in recent weeks and generally asked the committee to adopt the house language, including the fund, including funding Hennepin County, with the additional language to extend out the duration of the exception window and establish maximum capacity for providers seeking a transition. Lastly, RPAMN supports this bill's efforts to address the various policy issues impacting small BIPOC providers in our community. It contains language that seeks to address the unintended impact that the small customized living providers moratorium has had on providers who rent homes where their clients live. It also contains language that's seeking to address some of the unintended consequences of the complicate consequences of a complicated change in how people under the age of 55 are intended to serve, to be served within the system. The language in both areas continues to be worked on, but we, are, we, but we appreciate the continued efforts to improve the regulatory environment in which we operate. Thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know the Senate, they have to go and check in by 11, so Apple, if you can proceed and we'll figure out what time we can let the, we'll take a break soon. Recess. Ashwana Laikum and um, Honorable Chairs Noor Hoffman and members of the committee. I'm April Souter and I lead the senior independence efforts in southeast Minnesota that helps nearly a thousand elderly households to age in place through the efforts of 800 plus volunteers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of the Live Well at Home grants. While we appreciate the funding in both bills, they do vary widely. We urge you to support the Senate position that funds the program and most importantly, restructures Live Well by extending the grants to create provider stability. Like in the senior population to school children, each year a new crop of five-year-olds start school and seniors graduate. The state provides ongoing base funding to schools, not just for a period of years. And each year, a new group of older adults need services to age in place while others pass away. As, the school children, as with school children, year after year, seniors replace seniors. Having stable service providers ensures someone is there to care for our older residents. If no service provider exists, it matters not if someone receives a waiver. The Live Well grants have been around for nearly 20 years and are in need of updating to reflect the rapidly changing needs of our greatest expanding demographic. In the past five years, three providers in southeast Minnesota have closed their doors because they lost this important funding. Programs like ours are low cost with high impact because we leverage tens of thousands of volunteer hours which help alleviate a workforce crisis. A sliding fee scale makes services available to all and reduces the need for waivers. Grantees match state dollars dollar for dollar, which maximizes taxpayer impact. Live Well grants and locally raised dollars will keep our nonprofit service providers Ms. strong can, to serve you, your parents, and your grandparents. If you can wrap up your, your testimony so we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, David Hancock, so also with um, uh, the last two testifiers and also Dr. Johnson. Uh, if you can come to the testify table and we'll, we'll and with this too, I guarantee everyone who has signed up, we will come back by 11.30 and hear your voice here. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Noor, Chair Hoffman, members of the committee. My name is David Hancox, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for ACRA Care. ACRA serves people with disabilities, families, and older adults, and employs over 13,000 caregivers in all 87 counties. ACRA Care recipients manage their cares, and choose their care providers. ACRA PCA employees are unionized. ACRA's goal is that every PCA in Minnesota receive the proposed CBA rate of $19 per hour. The new collective bargaining agreement increases member wages on January 1st of 2024 and 2025. Simultaneously, the proposed budget increases the PCA reimbursement rate effective on the same dates. Respectfully, and while this is appreciated, 
The proposed reimbursement rate does not sufficiently meet the requirements of the CBA, which we support, and adequately cover remaining administrative costs. The actual PCA hourly expense under the CBA would be approximately $21.77 per hour. This leaves about $1.15 an hour, a very challenging 5% margin for administrative costs. Additionally, only 25% of PCAs and 13% of provider agencies will be covered by the CBA. These factors could have unintended consequences as providers may be forced to either transition their business model or sell their businesses to providers not subjected to the CBA. In either case, the PCAs who are intended to benefit from the new CBA wage would actually be forced to take a pay cut. Actually, ACRA does not want this to happen. Our request for the conference committee is to adopt the proposed rate in the House budget or combine the, propo the proposed biennium rates in the governor's budget into the first year for a 22% increase effective January 1st of 2024 and add an additional 5.21% effective January 1st, 2025. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the conference committee. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm an emergency medicine physician and former chair of the Opioid Prescribing Work Group. I'm here today to give testimony in support of the OPIP statute and for the welfare of the patients of Minnesota. It has come to my attention that there's opposition to the work of this group and proposal to shut down OPIP as early as June of 2024. This would be a grave mistake. I came to this work as an ER doctor at Methodist in 2005. I witnessed daily the chaos that opioids were causing in our patient population. I could not go a shift without seeing a patient on opioids for their chronic pain, and despite taking high doses, would still be in 10 out of 10 pain. Some patients were also overdosing and dying in front of me. Some I could save, and some I could not. I became a passionate activist in this crisis. I learned everything I could about what brought it about. And the sad and shocking truth is this was not an accident. This was a creation of the medical industry itself. The pharmaceutical companies may have been the greatest villains, but they could not have done it without the complicit participation of physicians. Physicians, especially pain physicians. Many became the greatest corporate mouthpieces for the opioid industry. When I see physician groups opposing OPIP, I beg you to consider this when you hear their recommendations. They have no credibility when it comes to managing this. They have sent a letter saying that we have state medical boards and so they can monitor safe practices. Well, we had state medical boards back in the 90s and 2000s. This crisis still happened. This crisis still happened while you had these experts saying, leave it to us, we've got this. They didn't. The American Medical Association is even corporate partners with some of the greatest offenders in the, with the uh, pharmaceutical industry who have caused this crisis. I sent you the Board of Trustees uh, meeting minutes and they've been parted with Malincrot, Janssen, and Teva, who agreed that they caused the crisis and paid billions in settlement costs. The OPWG members have no such conflict of interest. We based our decisions on data, not on business. The prescription crisis is not over. In 2021, over 16,000 Americans died of prescription overdose. This is the same level as it was in 2012, and no one argued we had a prescription crisis then. Furthermore, Prescriptions are often the gateway to the illicit uh, opioids and remain an important part of the chain that we need to shut down or manage reasonably and compassionately. The medical boards, physician groups, and the political outreach organizations have demonstrated repeatedly they do not deserve your trust. You should not give it to them until it's Dr. been Johnson, earned. if you can wrap up, please. Keep the OPIP statute and keep physicians accountable. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we are going to a recess for 30 minutes and come back. 11. Thank you. By 11.30.